This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and it never got quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. Paul Seabury and Angelo Codevilla wrote in their book, War Ends and Means, a blunt appraisal of war. One of the more telling passages from their book goes like this, quote, a belligerent with small regard for human life is far less sensitive to taking casualties than one accustomed to, to cherish life highly, a factor that surely must enter into strategic calculations. The American practice of body counting enemy casualties in the Vietnam War was mindless, innocently assuming that these deaths had a bearing on North Vietnamese capabilities and willpower. The weight of burdens up to some unknowable point is relative, nor will it do to try to calculate the economic costs of each side's losses or efforts. Not only do people put different values on things, but more important, military goods are valuable not for the material and labor that go into them, but for the strategic gains that can be got out of using them. No one in wartime has ever been struck by a piece of gross national product." End quote. Our guest today led a double life with violence. He is Larry Johnson, who experienced combat with F Troop, 17th Cavalry, 196th Infantry Brigade, AmeriCal Division. On his return from combat, he ended up training others who would eventually end up in Vietnam. After his time in the U.S. Army, Larry found a career in law enforcement and retired from the Clay County, Missouri Sheriff's Office. Larry now resides in Waianae and participates in veterans activities. Aloha. Hello. And welcome, Larry. Thank you very much for the invitation. My pleasure. We got a, a lot of pictures to go through, uh, and uh, you sent me a lot of stuff, and uh, I was really interested in the stories that you had uh, that uh, goes along with them. I'm going to take a look at the first one here, and uh, if you could explain what's going on here. Um. <clears throat> That was my bunk at one point in time before it all disappeared there. But I was um, had just arrived in country not very long before that and uh, was sitting down just relaxing. Which didn't happen too often, did it? No. Uh, <laughs> my f machine gun, 50 caliber, is sitting up on top and the 2 by 6 is there would protect us from rockets or mortars if they happened to come in and hit the ceiling. Well, let's explain what it was that you were doing in Vietnam. Let me go to the second uh, one there and see uh, what it was. These are, are what are known as uh, uh, APCs, or yes. Armored Personnel Carriers. And uh, I believe uh, uh, you are probably one on the, the, the track on the far left. Yes. And that's you up in the couple off. That's, uh, that's me kind of semi standing up there on the, <laughs> <laughs> in the, on the top of the track. And uh, no, I, I guess uh, this this brings to mind uh, some of the arguments that were made during the Vietnam War that uh, we were going after the enemy like uh, a business of instead of using a fly slaughter, we were using uh, <laughs> you know steamrollers to go after the fly. Uh, how effective were these things? They were pretty effective. We carried or transported infantry people on top occasionally, mm -hmm. and. Um, although they were not really good in, in rice paddy water and mud and foliage as you go to forest parts there that you could see, mm -hmm. um, they done a good job. Mm. Um, they carried a lot of ammo and they managed to get us from one place to the other um, no. pretty much safely. Well, I know that you were telling me, we go to the, the next one uh, in, in order there, 
uh, he had uh, he didn't really carry any troops inside the uh, the vehicles, uh, but this was your view of the world uh, from the cupola on top of the uh, the track vehicle. But uh, as you were telling me, uh, when you took what's called a rocket propelled grenade or an RPG. Uh, Sometimes the sides of the vehicle didn't exactly uh, absorb. <laughs> they were not. They were not necessarily steel on the sides. Yeah. And if an RPG did hit a side panel, um, as it melted its way through, it showered the inside with molten metal, mm -hmm. and was uh, quite a hazardous position to be in. Um, for instance, my particular location there on top, I sat on a two by six. Mm -hmm. So in the event we hit a mine, that the force inside would throw me up and away from the track. Hmm. Um, there's an <clears throat> uh, M79 grenade launcher there, and my 50 was there, and that was that was my home, pretty much. Yeah, and uh, I, I recall you saying that uh, you didn't really carry troops on the inside of those things because they were kind of hazardous to the health of the, the people inside them. And I believe at one time, that's how you got wounded. Uh, I got wounded from an RPG that, that happened to uh, break apart on its way in. It hit a rice paddy dike and a portion of it come off. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the rest of it came up and that was how I got wounded. Mm. Had um, a multitude of shrapnel uh, that eventually was taken out. <laughs> yeah, I know. We, we still carry the blue marks. <laughs> um, it was not a pretty sight. Yeah, no, it can, it can be. <laughs> Uh, as far as going out on missions in these things, I mean, did you have this feeling of invincibility or? There were times that you felt too safe and that pretty much um, was taken away as soon as they would ambush us or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you also felt that you had some protection against small arms fire and, and uh, that you could put back a whole lot more firepower than they were throwing at us. Um, but there were times that you felt like we can go through anything. Mm. Um, a lot of trees, a lot of bushes, a lot. Uh, the only thing we couldn't go through real easily was bamboo, because bamboo would bend over and then want to push us back, where yeah. a tree, on the other hand, would would break if it wasn't very big. Yeah, I know we're going to be coming up on a, uh, one of the pictures in here uh, where you have a line of vehicles uh, getting ready to go into the jungle, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was. The, the track vehicles on mass, and uh, I know that uh, we're going to see a picture of a Sheridan in here. I don't know. Which one do we have next here uh, coming up? Uh, there we go. Oh, that was a rather long day. Um, that's napalm going off um, or having been dropped. The uh, depressions in the soil are actually, I'm going to say, like tire marks for mm -hmm. a track. And as you can tell, we were further up and we had to back up because we were taking a lot of fire and uh, we called for air support and napalm happened to be one of the one of the things they dropped other than than explosives mm -hmm. yeah. and they dropped a lot of napalm which is now outlawed but uh, which is no longer used yes <laughs> at one point I know that uh, of course I was in a unit that used to drop that stuff on uh, on the bad guys. And uh, I can recall we, we would run out of it and uh, the, the ability to make napalm basically is, uh, I shouldn't give away t uh, trade secrets here, but uh, detergent and gasoline. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we would be actually filling the stuff. It would dry up and we would use it to uh, uh, heat up sea rations. Uh, it would come out of the canisters that we had on the aircraft and would just kind of ooze out. And we'd just break off a piece, light it up, and heat up our. We've done that rice. with C4. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, the uh, you get into these firefights and the thing, uh, uh, you would go out on patrols, I would assume. We would go out for sometimes just a few days. Um, other times we'd go out for a week or two, maybe three. Uh, we'd get resupplied out in the field and uh, um, for ammunition. And if we happen to have in injured people, they'd medevac people in or medevac them out. Mm -hmm. um, I got medevaced out, but the helicopter that I was medevaced out on was actually a gunship mm. because they put me next to the door gunner and the other people on the floor, and we flew out of there. 
Uh, as I mentioned in the program earlier, that uh, uh, with uh, Alan Ho, uh, we, the uh, the dust offs, which were the medevac helicopters, which had nice great big white squares with red crosses in them, uh, actually became targets as opposed to uh, being observed as far as the Geneva Convention. And I know that they were carrying M60s on the side uh, uh, for protection. The um, I got to see the helicopter that flew me out a few days later. <laughs> and um, it had a number of holes in the back section of it that I really never recalled being hit. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't see anyway. They had my eyes all covered up and yeah. with bandage and, and a number of different bandages all over me. But um, when I got to see the helicopter, I went, who, who flew in on that? <laughs> they, when they told me I did, I went, ooh, <laughs> we really shouldn't have made it back. <laughs> Just thankful that uh, there wasn't a whole lot that uh, was uh, possibly uh, vital to the flight of the aircraft. There's a lot of things they can hit in the tail section, and that was where most of the rounds were at. But I, I never remembered it being hit, or yeah. didn't remember hearing it. Yeah, yeah. Can we see the next uh, slide, please? Ah. Again, you guys are out. Looks like uh, not just APCs, but you also have a Sheridan or two there. We have a couple Sheridans there, uh, a number of APCs. We were out on a mission at that particular time, and we were uh, being resupplied. Uh, the individual there in the picture isn't me. It's a, a friend by the name of Eddie Craig, who just a few days after that picture was shot and killed. Mm -hmm. um, He'd been over to talk to me and, and was heading back towards his, his uh, Sheridan. And uh, he was also from Kansas, uh, one of three of us. And uh, both of the other ones were killed. I was the only one in that unit from Kansas that managed to make it back. But um, it's rather dry there, a little bit of mud where he's at from the, but the rice paddies there would look dry until you rode through them and then the it would, the water would start coming to the surface. But um, he uh, was a very good commander and many, many times I said, cover me and because I'd be out on foot and I never had to watch my back when I knew he was there. If I can, you know, how, how was he killed? And you said. He was actually killed by friendly fire. Yeah. Um, we had told the other APC that we were where we were at and not to be shooting our direction and uh, although they stayed away from us for a while when it did come in my driver Ron Russell said get down we're taking fire and I got down and Eddie got hit in the side of the head mm -hmm. had I not got down he wouldn't have been hit mm -hmm. from the direction that the rounds were mm -hmm. um, coming in we tried to do something with it, and at the time, friendly fire wasn't a real main topic. Um, it wasn't something that they followed up on a lot. No publicity like there is now. Yeah. If something yeah. like that would happen again. That's, it's, a, it's rather tragic that uh, those kinds of things happen uh, in combat, and uh, uh, I know a lot of steps have been taken uh, both in training and, uh, and, and with the technology that we have being able to uh, make sure that we don't hit the friendlies. Quite a bit so. Yeah. The, we, I laughed about it with Eddie on the first time he was shot because he was shot with an M16 the first time when he was on foot and got shot at and somebody got a little carried away and, mm. and um, Ed shot him in the shoulder. Oh, geez. It wasn't a severe injury. I mean, he was out for a few, couple of weeks and came back and eventually friendly fire got him again. Oh, that's bad. I'll tell you what, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, but first, uh, well, let's take a break. Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii's Volunteer Chief Operating Officer and occasional host, and this is Minky. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online, web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to ThinkTech will run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so ThinkTech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming. 
I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thanksforthinktech.cosvox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii's 30-plus weekly shows, thank you, mahalo, and shishe for your generosity. Welcome back. Uh, we're speaking with uh, Larry Johnson, a uh, veteran of uh, the AmeriCal Division. Uh, I guess it was an upper two core. I Corps. Uh, I Corps. Oh, you were in I Corps. That's yep. right. You guys we, were that far north. I just didn't a little bit that. south of Da Nang. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and again, if you look at the uh, the beginning of the program, you'll see the map of Vietnam and understand what we're talking about I Corps, two core, three core, and four core. Uh, Vietnam was divided into those core, or those regions or military regions mm -hmm. uh, for our benefit, not necessarily for the enemies, but for our benefit. Uh, where was your home base, by the way? Where you? The um, unit was actually stationed at Hawk Hill. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a little bit south of Da Nang. Uh, originally, the unit was a, uh, assigned to LZ Baldy, which on a recent 10 hour or 10 series program, um, LZ Baldy was pictured along with a sign that F Troop carried to. Oh, and Ken Burns' Hawk Hill. documentary, yeah. Yeah, during yeah. that documentary. Yeah. Um, but we were just a little bit south of Da Nang. We were north of, of a city called Tam Ki, but we went there on numerous occasions to block um, enemy forces that was coming in from from their west. And uh, if they were attacked, well, we were u usually one of the first people called. So you said you go out on uh, patrols or uh, missions that would last upwards of a week and be resupplied. How far west did you guys go? Because you guys are pretty close to the to the uh, sea, weren't you? We we went out into the sand dunes or the the, the sand on the ocean side, mm -hmm. and we went clear to the mountains and Hep Duck on the other side. Uh, Ashaw Valley was also in that same area, so the same amount of troops or the same type of troops were in both. I Corps was pretty busy. Yeah, it was. I can recall, uh, you know, even on uh, Christmas truce, it uh, wasn't so much of a truce. I think we probably ran more operations off of uh, the alert uh, alert pad on, on Christmas Day than we did uh, normally. We were out in the field for Christmas, yeah. and um, we couldn't shoot at them, but they were sniping at us. Mm -hmm. So. We were limited to what kind of round we could use. We were using tear gas and smoke and a few other things, but we couldn't use explosive rounds back to them, which on the 26th day of December proved to be the wrong thing to do, that we should have been shooting at them for the last three days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. Some of the things that occurred in Vietnam as far as policy, and uh, we've had other guests on the program talking about how uh, it was controlled uh, by Washington, and uh, the rules of engagement uh, uh, were necessarily dictated to us uh, that were not the way we were trained as we far were, as... Yeah, we were restricted in, in regards to some things that we could do in mm -hmm. other areas. I-Corps was more of a free fire zone most of the time. <laughs> uh, if you seen them, you could fire. Yeah. Um, we reconned by fire, which they can no longer do, which amounted to us firing at something to see if we get fire back, to see if they return fire. Let's take a look at the next uh, uh, picture here. What do we got? Ah, rather somber moment. That is a funeral. Uh, it covers nine people, um, nine friends, as a matter of fact. The helmets on the left side with the speakers were all track commanders or tank commanders. Um, and the three on the right hand side, uh, those were like machine gunners on the back of my track. They would wear a, a steel helmet. Mm -hmm. um, that was not a real happy occasion, but that was how we held our funerals. They do it a little different now, but no. that was one of our funerals. Um, and that's on a, on a Sheridan tank. It's on the front of a Sheridan tank. Uh, there's a piece of plywood or something underneath all of it. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, 
I remember the funeral quite well. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we all have moments like that. Uh, and I know that uh, at one point in time, we were told we couldn't have any uh, gatherings or any unit uh, uh, meetings or formal gatherings of uh, anything larger than 25 people. We made too much of a target. We made a target on, on, F, on Hawk Hill. Yeah. Uh, not only for that, but on a couple of other funerals. Oh. Um, they were not something you wanted to be involved in. Yeah. But F Troop during the years of 69 and 70 lost the most number of people that um, were killed no. uh, during the time that they were assigned to Vietnam. No. Can we see the next one, please? That's an American flag that I purchased, um, and we, I kept it. My uh, friend in Michigan, Ron Russell, has it now, um, and I had it framed. Whenever we came in out of the field, if we were involved in a firefight where um, enemy was killed, injured, captured, then we would hoist a flag up on our antenna, just like, mm -hmm. kind of like the fishermen do when they catch a marlin or something. Well, curiously, uh, looking at the flag, uh, when I first saw this picture, uh, I remember uh, uh, Alan Ho bringing the, the flag that he purchased in July, and I think that's where you got this. That's one. where I got mine. Uh, yeah. The difference between the two of them is that his was, I believe, quite a bit bigger, or at least a little bigger than, than that one. That one you could kind of roll up in a ball. Well, his was also uh, rather, I wouldn't say small, but I think it's probably around the same size, probably made by the same person. Could be made by the same person yeah. because the stars were plastic. And, yeah, so, so and, were the ones on Allen, you know, they, or vinyl, whatever, and then... Uh, it was some kind of vinyl or... Yeah. Cracked. Uh, over it, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't cloth. No, it wasn't. By no means. Yeah. I had it at a uh, ceremony where a, a memorial was dedicated in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And there were several people that came up and said that they thought that flag had seen more combat than some of the people that were there. <laughs> Can we go to the next one, please? Ah. <laughs> That's also me, a little younger, of course, and uh, I weigh a lot less. Um, the gentleman that was wearing that helmet um, didn't get to keep it. Um, I picked it up after he was shot. But um, I don't remember the picture being taken as the, the ironic part. A friend of mine recently sent it to me mm -hmm. and uh, with some comments along the way. But um, that was a Chinese-made helmet, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It wasn't real, it wasn't real, real heavy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of like tin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can we go to the, the next photo, I think, after this? Oh, this is the last one. Okay, great. Which brings me to the point. I mean, here you are uh, in, a, in a violent uh, atmosphere, of course, and uh, as you said, uh, in i -Corp, it was if you saw the bad guys, you could shoot them. Uh, you were enlisted, in a way, in, in law enforcement after your time in, in Vietnam, after you were also in training other people, uh, I guess, where at... Uh, Fort Leonard Wood, or? Uh, well, I was at Fort Knox when Fort I was Knox, okay. as a drill sergeant there. And then when I, when I came back, um, went into law enforcement relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. um, went into a reserve unit mm -hmm. and uh, then went right on the police department. You know? Well, the, the thing that I, I find interesting is uh, you and I both suffer from PTSD and, uh, and trying to control violence in a way and uh, frustration. And here you were in Vietnam, surrounded by armor, to some extent. To some extent. Uh, and yes, you were wounded, but uh, you you are now in a police car rolling around, and uh, you're facing an unknown situation similar to what you had in Vietnam. Uh, when you walk up to an automobile after you've pulled them over for a busted tail light or whatever, uh, I'm sure we've all seen episodes of cop or cops where uh, the, da the dash can takes pictures of uh, the officer walking up to the car and all of a sudden there's gunplay involved uh, and the car screeches off and uh, thankfully the, uh, the law enforcement officer is wearing some sort of protection 
in some of those he is, and in some yeah. they just he didn't make it. But um, I mean, how how it had to have uh, affected your ability uh, to do your job at some point in time. Uh, walking up on a car, not knowing, yes, um, it's a, a period of time that you don't really know what you're about to encounter. Mm -hmm. But about 95% of the time, those are nice people. Um, it's husband, wife, family, uh, perhaps, or just some kids that really aren't out to shoot you or shoot a police officer. Now I'm kind of wondering if you actually know for sure at all. But um, most of the time, it's, you just stop somebody that's Normal. They get a traffic ticket, or they had a tail light out, or they weren't violent. And the same thing in Vietnam. Not everybody you walked by in, t in any of the towns or the villages were violent. Mm -hmm. They maybe didn't like you, but they weren't intentionally ready to kill you. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm just uh, thinking that it, it, it had to have affected you both. Uh, I mean, you now had a, a diet of this in Vietnam. And you know, throughout a, a, a 20, 30 year career uh, in law enforcement, then uh, it had to have impacted you in some way. And uh, uh, although I've known you for several years, it's uh, uh, in terms of judging people, I know that uh, we've we've learned certain things in how to c control this, control that violence. And I think one of the things that you and I have both uh, benefited from is going to our vet group and uh, participating there. Uh, of course, we had our Monday night meeting last night. And, yes. Uh, I think that uh, we, as we were talking about it earlier, we, it was a good meeting. And uh, yeah. I, I highly recommend uh, other veterans to get involved with any of the vet center uh, activities. Uh, they very beneficial. There's, it's not just meeting other veterans, but there are other activities that are sponsored by the, the that center. There's a lot of jokes and we have snacks available <laughs> on our yeah. Monday night group. It's more of a meal, but uh, okay. we talk about anything. Yeah. Uh, the number of friends that I've met there that if my car broke down or I had a problem, I could probably call any one of them and have some help because we're now all friends. Yeah. We're not just veterans that happen to be on the island. Yeah. Well, Larry, I want to thank you very much for being here today. and. Uh, well, We'll be uh, talking to you some more later. <laughs> Thank you very much. A little over a week ago, we observed Veterans Day in the United States. Veterans Day is an outgrowth of the Remembrance Day, which was inaugurated by King George V in 1919. This in recognition of the war dead of what was then called the Great War. In some places, it is known as Armistice Day, and in others, Poppy Day, in reference to the poem in Flanders Field by the Canadian physician, Lieutenant Colonel John McCrae, who did not survive that war. I sincerely hope that while most of us got a day off from our daily grinds, you took a few moments to reflect upon the sacrifices made by so many of us all. Journalism is not objective. No matter how hard we try, we all carry some amount of prejudice towards a topic. However, there can be alternative journalism where an issue can be discussed without rhetoric or animosity. I believe this is what we have to offer here at Think Tech Hawaii. This media offers an opportunity to bring more than one perspective to the community. ThinkTech also provides information on a host of topics that can aid in improving your life. But all this costs money. We speak of free speech as one of our rights in our Constitution, but it requires maintenance. That maintenance has been measured in the lives of those who have defended it and by those who support such efforts as ThinkTech Hawaii through their contributions. The staff here are not volunteers and they would like to continue to pay their rent. The hosts of the programs you watch are volunteers. We do this out of service to the community. So please contribute to www.thanksforthinktech.causevox.com. The information on how to do so is listed on the screen below. We would love some feedback. If you have some comments, please send an email to 808vietnamvets at gmail.com. I would like to thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii for all their support and assistance. Special thanks go to Ray and Robert who go the extra mile. Truly without them, this program would not be possible. Please come back again next week for another issue of it never got quiet. Mahalo.